a pleasure to be here uh, on, uh, in the Stanford campus and talking to you all about uh, a topic close to my heart, uh, social entrepreneurship. Uh, <clears throat> Richard was mentioning in terms of how India has got the kind of a head start uh, in this uh, domain, but I think yeah, necessity is the mother of invention. India is a country of 1.2 billion people and uh, a lot of uh, problems uh, with the, uh, the uh, demographics there, be it in terms of poverty, be it in terms of illiteracy and so forth. So when you have so many problems and at such a wide scale, there is uh, uh, automatic uh, processes set in motion to try to kind of form solutions to those problems and uh, that's what yeah, gives uh, India a kind of a unique role in this domain. I <clears throat> want to uh, yeah, begin with uh, uh, just a quick outline in terms of what I uh, covered in this talk. Uh, and so I'm going to start by mentioning some things about yeah, Action for India. And uh, one of our key uh, programs at Action for India, uh, creating a network of uh, hubs of social innovation. Uh, then going to give you a brief background in terms of the status uh, or the current state of uh, social uh, enterprise social, social enterprise in India and uh, close by yeah, two uh, uh, quick topics one in terms of how the work in India is actually relevant uh, for social uh, uh, development practitioners around the world not just in India and how the people in this audience can engage uh, with uh, our organization <coughs> so <coughs> Our core mission at Action for India is to work with social innovators and by that I mean uh, they could be founders of for-profit social enterprises or they could be founders of not-for-profit NGOs but where they are addressing critical social issues in five sectors education, healthcare, energy, livelihoods and agriculture. These are kind of the usual suspects when one talks of social innovation, social entrepreneurship. But what we do is we identify what we refer to as poised to scale social entrepreneurs in these five sectors and then uh, provide them, give them access to the resources that they need in uh, scaling up. And this could be access to funding, access to mentorship, access to technology resources, access to government decision makers and access to local partners or hub champions. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Our inspiration is uh, this gentleman uh, whose picture you see, Sam Petroda. He will be joining us in the talk later on. Sam Petroda uh, is currently the advisor to the Prime Minister of India and he's the chairman of India's National Innovation Council. And uh, back in the 1980s, uh, when uh, he was a member of the government of the Union Cabinet of India uh, with Rajiv Gandhi as uh, Prime Minister, he helped launch a series of activities uh, which in retrospect came to be known as the Telecom Revolution. And today in India, if you have 900 million cell phones for a population of 1.2 billion people and one of the fastest growing telecom markets in the world, a lot of the credit can be traced back to the work that Sam Petroda did back in the 80s. Uh, and uh, so I had met with him at a alumni, uh, an IIT alumni conference in Washington DC several years ago. I'd been loosely in touch with him and in the last couple of years those interactions became more frequent and focused leading to the current mission of this organization and the launch of our first event in January of 2002. So we are a fairly nascent organization, about a year and a half old, but uh, this is uh, how it all began. Uh, and uh, I should uh, uh, accept, I mean, I should uh, recognize, acknowledge the connection that uh, Action for India has to Stanford. Among the advisory board, there are at least four individuals uh, who are either current Stanford faculty or uh, who have been Stanford alums. On the left is uh, Mark Granovetter, he's the chair of the Department of Sociology. On the right is Professor Hayagriva Rao, he's a professor in uh, the uh, GSB. And uh, here you have Srini Akaraju, who's a Stanford MD and PhD, is currently a general partner at Sofinovo Ventures, it's a biotech uh, VC firm. And at the bottom you have GDS Ram Kumar, uh, who was again a PhD in computer science and currently is an entrepreneur with Concept IO. So uh, <clears throat> there's been a, uh, yeah, quite a bit of uh, yeah, expertise and insights drawn from these individuals. So I'm thankful to the community that you all represent. Uh, I just want to yeah, take a minute to give you a better context in terms of what Action for India is and uh, what exactly we do. I did mention in the first slide, but uh, I want to use, uh, yeah, by way of explanation, uh, this organization called uh, Rashtriya Shwast Bhima Yojana, RSBY for short. So uh, RSBY is a public-private partnership between the government of India and about 12 different private health insurance companies. Uh, it was founded by this uh, gentleman here, Anil Swaroop. He's one of the senior bureaucrats in India. He's part of the Ministry of Labor in New Delhi. He started this initiative about four years ago. And there are a few uh, interesting things about this initiative. Given that this program was targeting poor people, 
uh, who are mostly illiterate, uh, they, the founders of the program, they didn't want the participants to fill up elaborate health insurance forms or uh, do signatures. So they designed the program to be completely paperless. And they also wanted to minimize fraud in the system. Uh, so what happens is, yeah, uh, anybody who signs up for the program, uh, he makes a one, he or she makes a one-time payment of 30 rupees, which is 60 cents, and uh, with that payment, they and a family of up to four members gets access to healthcare benefits up to 30,000 rupees or 600 dollars, which is a pretty good deal for the individual and the family. But the reason why that, uh, yeah, it's uh, so attractive is because the government of India heavily subsidizes this program. But the reason why the private health insurance companies participate in a program like this is because it makes business sense for them to do so, not because it's a charity activity for them. That's the way the whole program has been architected and that's interesting in its own right. Uh, uh, so uh, what happens is, yeah, so I told you that the program was designed to be paperless. It's also designed to be cashless. So uh, apart from the initial 30 uh, rupees that uh, the participants give to the government, there's no other cash in the system. So how do you make a health insurance program cashless and paperless? So what they do is they give the smart cards with a chip embedded in it to each participant. So whenever these participants yeah, go to a hospital or a clinic for a treatment, the card is swiped on the premises like a, a credit card and all the transactions happen at the back end. So these are kind of yeah, interesting things in their own right. One of the reasons I'm sharing this here at the beginning of my presentation is uh, the RSBY initiative has a few attributes that are aligned with the kind of work that we are doing or we want to do more of. Firstly, it's enabling this program is at the core, it's enabling social good at the bottom of the pyramid. Basically, poor people are getting access to health care benefits, and that's a good thing. Secondly, this program has achieved rapid scale in a short span of time. Uh, the program was begun, as I said, four years ago, and in these four years, about 33 million smart cards have been distributed among the uh, population, and assuming a family size of four, about 130 million Indians have come under the umbrella of this program. So even in a country of 1.2 billion people, this is a non-trivial significant number. And thirdly, bulk of this growth, uh, this rapid growth has happened because the RSBY founders were very particular about leveraging technology to the health right from the word go. And in this case, smart card technology. So uh, Action for India being a year and a half old organization has had nothing to do with the success of this initiative. But uh, the reason I share this is because what we want to do or be at Action for India is to serve as a catalyst in the birth of and growth of initiatives like RSBY, which embody these three characteristics and again, uh, enable social good at the bottom of the program, achieve rapid scale in a short span of time, and uh, the organization uses technology as part of its current business model or as part of its future uh, scaling uh, ambition. So that's uh, the kind of organization that you want to work with and help scale. <coughs> uh, and uh, as I mentioned in my initial uh, this thing, so the five factors, I mean, when social innovators are looking to scale, at uh, the core of it, I mean, it's not rocket science. The needs that they have are pretty uh, kind of commonsensical. They need funding, uh, they need mentors, they need technology resources, uh, and government. Yeah, that's a touchy uh, topic, at least in the US. Uh, so one does not have to take money from the government for your funding or what have you. But in the social sector, especially in India, one cannot afford to ignore the government. Because the government is such a powerful distribution channel for your products or services, you cannot achieve significant scale unless you partner with the government and interface with the government at different levels. And finally, local partners or hub champions. So through that, uh, and I'll be talking a little bit more uh, later on, uh, we intend to give market expansion opportunities to the innovators in our network. So these are the different ways in which uh, we work with the social innovators and help them scale. So uh, I want to uh, start off uh, yeah, by giving you a few examples of some of the innovators uh, in India, especially given this is an audience which uh, uh, yeah, uh, knows the power of technology. I have uh, chosen those organizations which have integrated technology to their operating and business models. So this organization, Jaldut, the founder is a, a gentleman uh, by the name Chandu Chavan. He comes from the western city of uh, Pune in India. And uh, he's a very successful uh, commercial uh, entrepreneur. Uh, he runs a 1,000 crores or $200 million annual revenue business uh, in uh, uh, India, uh, something called Innoventive. And about three, four years ago, uh, he uh, got interested in the social sector, and specifically in the uh, domain of purification of water and <coughs> delivery of purified water door to door. So what he does is he's got these uh, pickup trucks or three-wheel pickup trucks, like the one that you see in the picture. And he's got a large container there which has a capacity for about 500 liters of water 
and then he's got a state of the art filtration system uh, which kind of filters bacteria, virus, arsenic, fluoride and w what have you. Uh, so basically what happens is he, this vehicle can go to any source of water. Uh, it could be a bore well, it could be a pond, lake. So as long as the, uh, uh, the purification is uh, kind of below a particular threshold, the impurities are below a particular threshold, uh, they can pump the water from that source into that container and they can use the filtration system to do the purification in C2 uh, on the vehicle itself and then the vehicle can go door to door uh, uh, in the area and uh, uh, kind of yeah, uh, sell uh, this purified water. So uh, again water, yeah, people say that, that the third world war will not be uh, fought for oil but it will be fought for water. So this is increasingly becoming a more and more serious problem uh, and uh, this is uh, in some sense yeah, uh, innovative solution and actually the viability of the business model of this, uh, believe it or not, is actually depends on, a GP, uh, on an algorithm uh, uh, which is going to kind of uh, optimize the routes that this vehicle takes for delivery of the water. So right now he's in search for uh, yeah, uh, kind of refining that uh, optimized algorithm uh, which will help him uh, kind of reduce his uh, transportation cost to make this a uh, viable business model. Uh, so any of you who are into optimization algorithms, I'd love to speak with you about this. Uh, then uh, one here is Bhavani and uh, so uh, yeah, th she's a, a lady who works in the vocational training space and uh, she uh, uh, basically, uh, if some of you are in the computer science domain, you know uh, what the field of haptics is, H-A-P-T-I-C-S. It's the field of computer human interface. So she leverages the principles of haptics and creates virtual simulated environments uh, through which this whole vocational training can be uh, accelerated and can be scaled up. So one of the interesting things she's doing is, uh, the picture below you see a lot of these women. These women have been trained to become plumbers in the state of Kerala. Uh, so normally when you want to train anybody to become a plumber, what do you do? You take them to the field, you uh, yeah, teach them how to cut pipes or you teach them how to fix a leaky faucet and uh, uh, that's how they learn the uh, yeah, uh, trade. But because of the technology that she's developed, uh, say that uh, the act of cutting a pipe, you don't have to take that person to the field, you don't have to have a hacksaw, you don't have to have a pipe, but uh, in the computer lab itself, uh, the person who is being trained can experience the resistance that one feels when you put the hacks out of the pipe. So what essentially uh, all this uh, yeah, uh, stuff does is it reduces the amount of resources required to train a set number of people and uh, if the resources are the same, more number of people can be uh, taught things faster. Uh, and uh, in a country uh, like India where 500 million people are below 25 years of age and uh, several tens of millions of jobs are required each year, uh, something like this uh, can have great potential in terms of training people faster and giving them the jobs that they need. On the right uh, is Anu Sridharan. Uh, she's a, a Berkeley grad who is now uh, relocated to India and her firm is something called Next Drop. And uh, the very uh, simple uh, yeah, uh, idea, basically uh, the water supply that here which you take for granted, you have water supply 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. In India, it's a much more yeah, challenging thing, uh, especially in the summers and when uh, yeah, things are, the monsoons haven't arrived on time and things like that. Uh, the water supply becomes very uh, haphazard, random and people yeah, waste lots of, uh, the, so the water supply is only on a particular windows of time and uh, people don't know when they're going to get that water. So people tend to waste lots of time in terms of how uh, these things, uh, yeah, in terms of collecting the water that they need for their food and so forth. So she's developed uh, some yeah, interesting solutions, uh, yeah, leveraging the mobile platform to reduce that waiting time to make things more predictable. And she started off with a uh, tier three city in, uh, called Hubli in uh, Northwest Karnataka. And now she's in the process of raising funds to kind of take it up to uh, the uh, national level in uh, other tier one, tier two cities. And uh, <coughs> this gentleman, Sean Blacksford, is the founder of a company called Baba Job. Baba Job uh, is an organization uh, that, uh, you're familiar with monster.com in this country? It's basically it's a job matching site. Uh, engineer, project manager, salesman uh, goes to go, go to that side to kind of yeah, find uh, uh, relevant job opportunities. So what Monster does for the professional sector, Baba Job does for the informal sector. 
what do I mean by the informal sector? They could be cooks, uh, drivers, uh, rural BPO, entry level workers, and so forth. Most of them are illiterate. They can't, uh, yeah, do not have the uh, computer literacy to be able to kind of, uh, yeah, put their own profiles online and so forth. So uh, what they do is they've got this internet kiosks where these people can go there and submit basic information about themselves. For example, uh, imagine yeah, that uh, this was going on in uh, uh, the Silicon Valley. So they give them, uh, yeah, are they in Palo Alto or they in the East Bay or they uh, in San Francisco and so forth, the location where they want to kind of find the next gig. Secondly, the billing preferences. Yeah, do they want uh, yeah, $10 uh, uh, an hour job, $20 an hour job or $50 an hour job? So basic information and then in India, as I mentioned to you, we, have, we are a country of 900 million uh, cell phones. So almost everybody has a cell phone. And so as soon as a potential employer ceases a profile that matches his requirements, a SMS is sent by Baba Job to that individual uh, informing him about that opportunity. So uh, again, yeah, so what this is essentially doing is when people have more opportunities, for example, take a chauffeur. There are lots of chauffeurs uh, in India. I mean, that's not considered a luxury like in this country. Uh, that's uh, more part of uh, uh, the everyday life there. So uh, they, uh, if they were trying to look for a new gig, they're restricted to their family life, family uh, or friends or the neighborhood that they operate in. But because of this technology, now they have access to more opportunities from around the country. Uh, around, not around, around the city. So the moment you have more opportunities, it improves your negotiating leverage. It, it improves your average daily incomes. So this is a fantastic example of how technology is being used to make a difference to people's lives at the bottom of the pyramid. That's Baba Job. And finally, Digital Green. So Digital Green is in the field of agriculture. Uh, so the gentleman, uh, the founder, Rikin Gandhi, uh, he's actually an MIT alum who went back to India about four years ago, started this uh, yeah, uh, venture. And basically what he does is he goes to a rural area and identifies a within quotes successful farmer. And then videotapes the farmer as he's going about his business, the fertilizers that he uses, the seeds that he uses, the irrigation method that he uses, and so forth. And then makes those videos available to farmers in surrounding villages. That's the intervention. But that simple intervention has been proven to be more significant in enhancing agricultural productivity than anything else that the government has done or anything else that uh, the multinational uh, organization like United Nations has done. So this is at the core. What it is all about is in terms of assimilation of best practices and uh, yeah, the power of the local uh, network. So if somebody were to uh, do this videos in uh, northern part of India, say Kashmir, and take those videos in the southern part of India, say Kanyakumari, there would not be that much impact. In fact, one of the first questions that apparently uh, Rikin gets asked when he takes his videos is, where is this farmer whose videos you're showing me? Where is he from? So the hypothesis is that if, uh, if this farmer in next door or next village can do that, why can't I do it? And therein lies the power of this idea. Sanjay, real quickly, you've given us four really interesting examples. Are these organized as nonprofits or are they organized as regular companies? Uh, I know Digital Green is a not for profit organization. Okay. It was spun off as part of Microsoft Research and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation okay. gave them a grant. Baba Job is a for profit company, okay. and uh, Vinod Kosla's social Kosla impact has invested in them. Uh, and sorry. Uh, Bhavani, uh, the Amachi Labs is a not-for-profit. Okay. And Anu Drops, I know she's looking for venture funding. She'll be here next week, actually. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's the good mix <laughs> okay. of uh, both of them. Yeah. Now, is AFI providing mentoring to the? Sure. Groups? So uh, each one of these individuals are uh, kind of participants in our annual forums that we do, okay. and I talk about that in a minute. And okay. for example, with uh, Anu, when she's going to be here in the valley next week, I'm going to be connecting her with some of the. Uh, yep, investors, angel investors in my network and see if she can kind of uh, get okay. any funding. Great, yeah. thank you. Okay, uh, and uh, so uh, among the other things that we do, so I gave you a good glimpse in terms of some of the members in our network and from as part of the core programming activity at Action for India, one of the things that we do is organize these annual forums. So this year we organized a forum in Delhi we had 100 of these young innovators. And you can imagine what kind of uh, yeah, uh, vibrations would, uh, and atmosphere and enthusiasm uh, there would be when 100 of these get together. So uh, uh, joining them were about 100 influencers. Uh, this include in, uh, yeah, investors, donors, public policy officials, government representatives, and what have you. Uh, and uh, with them were Sam Petroda. Uh, he was there in person uh, and members of the National Innovation Council. And also Mr. Desh Deshpande. I'll be talking about him as well. And so. For a weekend, uh, this entire community uh, was engaged. And the whole theme was in terms of 
what are the challenges that these innovators face in scaling uh, the impact of their organizations? And what role can technology play in helping them scale? What role can government play in helping them scale? So that's uh, the part of the forum. So we do this once every year. Uh, the next forum is uh, coming up in January 2014. So if any of you are in India and would like to attend, uh, do drop me a line. Uh, these are some uh, pictures that we have. Uh, and on the top left, you see uh, about yeah, 10, of, uh, 10, 12 of these uh, individual innovators. So we go to great lengths to source these 100. We have partnerships with the who's who of social entrepreneurship in India. And so we have filtering criteria to kind of get to the 100. And within the 100, we further select 10 of them, two in each of the five sectors, and they're given an opportunity to share about the work that they're doing and the innovation, uh, how they're introducing innovation to the sector. So uh, that's a picture there. And then we had a picture which was uh, with uh, Desh Deshpande uh, at the center. Arun Mayer was a member of a planning commission. And Shiv Kemka was a senior uh, industrialist. So this was uh, uh, telecast on Bloomberg TV. And uh, well, the picture on the right is a gentleman by the name Neil Patel. Uh, he won a growth prize uh, that we uh, kind of awarded. He's a Stanford PhD in computer science. He's doing some very interesting things in the agriculture domain and so forth. Uh, so this is the growth prize that I talked about. So we worked uh, on this competition along with Ashoka. This is the global network of social entrepreneurs. We have Darlene from Ashoka uh, here. Uh, so we uh, kind of monitored the progress of about 60 to 70 different organizations across these five sectors. And then uh, we had Mr. Desh Pandey, Mr. Petroda, Mr. Anand Mahindra, uh, Professor Hagi Rao here at Stanford. These were all, and Sushmita Ghosh from Ashoka. They're all members of the jury uh, to kind of determine uh, who were going to be the winners of this growth prize competition. And we plan to kind of continue this uh, in the coming years as well. So uh, some of the other projects, so in addition to the annual forum, the mentorship network, as I said, yeah, uh, having uh, opportunity uh, to uh, find uh, the right mentors who can guide them in the scaling efforts is key. So we are planning to kind of yeah, use an online platform. And uh, we have uh, a Silicon Valley chapter for Action for India. And a lot of, uh, as you know, uh, the Valley is home to a large concentration of Indian origin entrepreneurs, executives, investors. And a lot of them have an urge to kind of contribute back to India and connect with uh, what's happening there. So we'd like to uh, leverage a uh, mentoring platform to get their time uh, to mentor some of the social innovators in India. We have a debt financing advisory service. We have uh, kind of uh, partnered with some uh, public sector banks in India. And we are, off, we are going to offer uh, collateral free low interest bank loans uh, to uh, some of the selected uh, innovators in our network. And then an uh, online learning community, again, uh, facilitate uh, yeah, through platforms like WebEx or what have you, one too many mentorship opportunities where a particular individual, depending on his expertise, be it in terms of customer acquisition, distribution, social media, what have you, uh, on topics of relevance to the social innovators, they're able to share their expertise. <coughs> So yeah, this is uh, uh, the next uh, section is about uh, a key programmatic focus area of Action for India. And uh, I want to yeah, talk about uh, 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 what is kind of the, again, inspiration uh, for this uh, uh, program. The gentleman uh, that you see there is Desh Deshpande. How many in this uh, room have uh, heard about Deshpande before? OK, a few hands. I just want to take a minute to uh, mention a little bit uh, more about him. He's one of the most successful Indian origin entrepreneurs, or even yeah, entrepreneur period, in the US. He's based in Boston. He's a telecom guy. He's founded at least three firms, which all went to north of billion dollar market caps in uh, market valuation. And uh, he sits on the board of MIT. And uh, he, President Obama has selected him to be a co-chair for the Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. It's a 30-member organization. And uh, it's co-chaired. The other co-chair is Steve Case, the founder of AOL. So uh, that's the background. But uh, the reason I include him here is uh, he's doing some very interesting things back in India. Uh, so he comes from this home state of Karnataka. Uh, Bangalore is the capital city of Karnataka. So he, has, uh, he and his wife, Jayashree, through the Deshpande Foundation, have been doing an experiment in that region uh, of Karnataka. Uh, it's uh, called the, the experiment. The project is called the Sandbox. So they've been uh, they initiated this project about five years ago. So basically, what they do is they've been, I mean, uh, pumping in about three to four million dollars every year, and that money is used to support the work of about eighty to hundred different social organizations in four sectors: education, healthcare, livelihoods, agriculture. So. Even though they are doing their work in a particular region of India, uh, Deshpande doesn't view this as a regional development initiative. He's not doing this just because Hubli is his native place and everything is fine in Hubli, then everything is fine in the world. But he's using this because, uh, but he treats this as a social innovation lab. And by that, what I mean is that, yeah, so he identifies organizations of potential 
and whichever organizations are thriving, he, he uh, kind of uh, he closely monitors their progress and pumps in additional resources so that they scale to the national and international level. The admirable thing of what Deshpande is doing with the sandbox is he's trying to bring in the best practices of the business world into the not-for-profit world. Um, and I just want to uh, share with you two organizations that have thrived in that sandbox. One of them is this organization called Agastya. So Agastya is basically a program that promotes scientific curiosity in rural underprivileged kids. And uh, uh, so they have this mobile vans which have uh, uh, equipment to do experiments in, in chemistry, physics, astronomy and so forth. And these vans go from school to school, village to village and in a yeah, three hour period about 200 experiments are showcased to the students. So uh, this program is actually having impact. Uh, some of you in the room might know about the Intel Science Talent Search exam in this country. So that's primarily to identify research prowess in uh, undergraduate uh, students, uh, in high school students in this country. So they have a regional counterpart to this exam uh, in India. And in the last few years, among the top 10 winners, at least four of them have been uh, alumni of this Agastya program. So it's not that just in a three-hour program by watching a three-hour show, they're becoming geniuses. But the Agastya organizers, they do some follow-up work uh, beyond <laughs> that initial program. and uh, so. Uh, it's having a lot of impact. I mean, like people say in the social development world that don't give a man a fish, teach him how to fish. But here, what's happening is you are igniting the spark of creativity, imagination in these children. And once that spark is ignited, people don't go back to the original state. So the lo lo long-term impact of a program like this is uh, yeah, invaluable. Uh, secondly, is this organization called Akshaya Patra. And again, uh, how many in the room have heard about this program? OK, there's one. Uh, to there. Okay. So uh, this is uh, again uh, quickly, uh, it's a program to feed midday meals to school children in government schools in India. And uh, so a, a lot of uh, poverty, uh, especially in rural India, so people don't even send the kids to school. Uh, they want them on their family uh, land to help with agriculture and so forth. So this is an effort to get schools to. Uh, 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 get children to schools with the promise of giving them a one full meal in a day and the hope is that once they come to school they'll also attend some classes and pick something along the way. So this program was begun by the Hari Rama Hare Krishna folks, the ISKCON folks uh, about 10 years ago. They started by feeding about 1000 kids in schools in and around Bangalore. Now 10 years later after coming under the umbrella of the sandbox the program feeds 1.3 million kids every day in 20 locations around the country. And that kind of scale doesn't happen randomly. Uh, there are, as I said, best practices. Uh, so if you walk into a kitchen in Hubli, it's probably, if not the world's largest single kitchen, at least Asia's largest single kitchen. There are these tall towers that you see. You feel as if you walk into a petroleum refinery. One tar is separating the uh, rice from the stones. One tar is boiling the rice, boiling the, one tar is boiling the samba. They've automated the packing of the meals. And they got the average cost of the meal down to about 5 rupees or 10 cents a meal. And uh, they do a lot of fundraising here in the US a $28 donation feeds one kid for an entire year in India. So this program came to the attention of President Bill Clinton. A few years ago, there was a, this massive earthquake, earthquake in Haiti. And uh, so President Clinton was the head of the relief efforts there. And uh, there was a requirement for uh, yeah, similar kitchens where uh, low uh, cost quality meals could be disseminated in a fast manner. So President Clinton took Mr. Deshpande along with him to Haiti to see if similar kitchens as the one in Hubli could be set up for the faster dissemination of meals. Uh, and uh, so uh, these are the kind of uh, programs that are thriving in the sandbox. And what we at Action for India have done recently is we have signed a memorandum of understanding with the Deshpande Foundation. And the memorandum of understanding enables us, uh, through that, we are going to evangelize or promote this concept of a regional hub of social innovation. And we are going to identify champions who are going to shepherd these regional hubs in different parts of the country. And they're going to commit financial and in-kind resources to launch and maintain these hubs. And the eventual vision of this program is to have a learning network of these regional hubs around the country, wherein the best practices of one hub would flow into the other, and thereby the broader socio-economic development of the country could be accelerated. This is kind of the really uh, ambitious uh, agenda, ambitious vision. But at the core, when you talk of yeah, setting up a new hub, what does it mean? So first thing, you do a reconnaissance of that region. Uh, whatever new region that you pick up. So what are the most pressing gaps in that region? Is it, edu is it uh, in education? What, what is the problem that eighth grade students are uh, dropping out of school in uh, healthcare? Is the mother's mortality during childbirth a problem? Or 
so you identify the most pressing problems. And the second step that you do is you look at your existing network of social innovators and you try to figure out who are the social innovators who already developed solutions or products to address the gaps of that region. And you try to reduce the friction or provide incentives for these innovators to come to that region to make a difference to the problem. And finally, the third point, which is the most important point, at least in Mr. Deshpande's mind, is to create a learning uh, or yeah, a nurturing environment of uh, a nurturing ecosystem where some of the local population uh, gets inspired and they become innovators themselves. Because if you depend on outsiders coming in for a short span of time, that change is never really sustainable. You need to have the local population invested and in, involved in developing solutions. So uh, that is the third step. So we have already uh, yeah, uh, identified about, uh, I'll just come to this in a uh, minute. So there are about five locations we've already identified in uh, different parts of the country, two in North India, three in South India. So we've got uh, uh, in North India, in Delhi, the Dela Foundation, which is India's largest real estate company. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, Dilip Modi, who is a telecom uh, entrepreneur in the western uh, state of Uttar Pradesh. We have Raju Reddy, uh, uh, who is a Silicon Valley uh, successful entrepreneur, who is from the state of Andhra Pradesh, Nizambad. And uh, Srini Raju, who runs a $1.2 billion private equity fund from Hyderabad. So he's promoting a new city called Sri City in Andhra Pradesh again. And finally, Sangeeta Reddy uh, uh, from Chitur district. She is one of the directors at uh, Apollo Hospitals. It's part of the founding family. It, Apollo Hospitals is the nation's largest network of hospitals in India. So we've got individuals who have the financial wherewithal and who've got the social commitment to uh, adopt uh, these regions and help launch uh, uh, regional hub to social innovation in those regions. Uh, <coughs> and so this is, gives you a model in terms of how uh, the uh, hub would work. So we've got Action for India in the middle. There are the uh, financial resources. It, it could be philanthropic resources. So the local partners or the corporate houses with the CSR funds. And the government uh, could have some of the innovation funds coming into that region. Excuse me. And then we have the resources. So uh, Deshpande Foundation is a knowledge partner. They've been at it for the last five years. They know what works, what doesn't work in a region. And there'll be a lot of customization with each new hub. But some of those learnings could be leveraged to make things faster, cheaper, better. And uh, so uh, that's kind of the non-financial kind of resources. And uh, yeah, uh, we uh, try to kind of enlist the social innovators to kind of come to the region. We encourage some of the local talent to become innovators. Uh, and uh, this, in the end, leads to social economic development in the target area. But again, I should uh, kind of mention that these things are not a month-long project or a quarter-long pro quarter project. It takes three years, five years, eight years before there is any significant uh, difference in the social indicators of the region. So uh, it's a, a, a need to be patient uh, with how things happen there. These are some of the pat partners here. And uh, uh, yeah, just closing out on this, and uh, we want to uh, get uh, the support of uh, different uh, uh, people, yeah, they could be high net worth individuals, they could be CSR departments of corporates, they could be foundations, or they could be government uh, departments. So in the past, uh, for the two forums that you've held, we've had the Deshpande Foundation, we had Nokia, Intel, Hewlett Packard, uh, those kind of organizations have supported us. We've, as I said, formed partnerships with the Who's Who uh, in India in social entrepreneurship, be it the IIT alumni, be it the Deshpande Foundation, the NASCOM Foundation, and so forth. So it's been a this kind of work cannot be done alone. So the collaboration is the key, and we've been uh, proactive in reaching out to all the various partners. Uh, and I'll skip this. Uh, I'll skip this social enterprise in India. I just want to, uh, since in the interest of time, have uh, uh, <coughs> uh, making a work relevant globally. So what is happening in India is not relevant just for India alone. Some of these ideas, be it in terms of frugal innovation, being able to kind of develop products or solutions at a fraction of the cost that are available elsewhere in the world, that is something I think would be relevant to people not just in India, but uh, yeah, people in be it Africa, Latin America, or other parts of Asia. So the sandbox that I talked to you about in Northwest Karnataka, the five years of experiments there have given enough insights that the Deshpande Foundation has opened a new sandbox in Merrimack Valley. Uh, this is in the uh, suburbs of Boston. And they we were trying to do something in Louisiana. They're already doing something in Canada. So the innovation lab uh, that was set up in Hubli is uh, giving uh, a, a fountain of insights which are being uh, replicated or customized in other parts of the world. So it uh, is useful to kind of yeah, think in terms of how uh, closely following the work, studying the work in this sector in India would uh, be relevant and useful uh, to people uh, even here. I talked to you about the Akshay Patra, about the Haiti, how 
President uh, uh, Clinton actually uh, was uh, uh, taking uh, <coughs> this Deshpande to Haiti. Digital Green, I mentioned to you about the work in being done in agriculture. So he's already been, the work that he's done in the states of India, now he's going to different parts of Africa and even China. I was hearing him say that a couple of weeks ago he was in China and they're trying to see if similar uh, things can be done in China. So it's finding global uh, opportunities for replication and not just in India. And uh, okay. yeah. Okay. So uh, the last slide of my presentation is how you can get involved. And again, so you are right here in the valley, and the valley is the center of, it's the epicenter of technology innovation for the universe. So one clear uh, 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 dimension in which you could uh, potentially engage with uh, the innovators in our network is to kind of, yeah, uh, look at uh, the problems that they're trying to solve, look at the technologies that you have access to in your domain of work, and see if there's any overlap in which your technologies can help make things faster, cheaper, better for them. Then there's the mentorship uh, piece. As I said, uh, you don't have to be physically present in uh, uh, India to be able to kind of mentor these people. We've got online platforms nowadays, yeah, Skype or WebEx, or even just a phone call uh, could be able to uh, get, get people connected. Uh, so uh, depending on your sector of interest, be it education, healthcare, energy, uh, we'd be happy to, uh, for those interested, make the necessary connections with innovators in that sector. And the funding, of course, uh, so, so uh, the funding could be equity funding, it could be grant funding, it could be debt funding. Uh, so uh, one potential thing, if you're interested in making angel investments, uh, uh, that could be, uh, again, an opportunity. I told you about Anu Sridharan, the Berkeley grad uh, with the organization Next Drop. So she's trying to raise money uh, for uh, expanding her organizations in India. So this is not charity. So if you invest in an organization, it's a financial transaction. Uh, not only do you have the satisfaction in terms of engaging the project, which enables social good, but also get financial returns for your project. Uh, then uh, we talked about uh, technology, uh, working with government friendly. So I think, uh, yeah, from here, yeah, there are organizations like USAID, for instance, which uh, uh, supports projects all around the world, not just in uh, US. So there could be opportunities for some of these government agencies to engage uh, with the innovators there. And finally, uh, the hub champions. So there would be opportunities, as I said, there's, we are trying to build this network of these regional hubs of social innovation. And uh, so if you are interested, you could uh, intern with Action for India and set up time to actually uh, relocate yourself for three months, six months, nine months, and then help oversee some of these uh, work uh, with the social innovators are doing in the region. So that's another opportunity. So with that, I'll stop here. Yeah, I know that I've right. gone way behind. No, yeah. Sanjay, that's, that's fantastic. If I can ask Radhika to join us up on stage and we'll go, no, please. Sure, okay. Now we're gonna do the panel discussion part of this. Uh, Radhika, tell us a little bit about the Silicon Valley chapter and also introduce yourself while I try to get the next set set up, okay? Sure. So I'm a Stanford alum, a computer science department from a while ago. Pleasure to be back at my alma mater. And uh, I'm a high-tech entrepreneur, been in the high-tech space, big companies, small companies, early days of the internet, exciting times here. And about four or five years ago, I got very interested in the world of social causes, uh, social entrepreneurship, and uh, involved in a few organizations in the education, human rights, livelihood space. And uh, also very involved in mentoring. I'm an active mentor at StarTex and uh, Skydeck Labs Berkeley. I'd just like to mention that uh, Jeffrey, Jeff, Burns, um, um, Jeff Burton here of Skydex Labs is here, and the amazing social entrepreneur Gunita from Berkeley and uh, they're doing amazing stuff there as well. And then we have some StarTex mentees here. So um, with that, I will talk a little bit about the chapter here that we're looking at setting up. We've been looking at engaging Silicon Valley resources to help AFI. What we learned in some of the other social causes we engage with, including a group called Rajiv Circle that George Gregory is here with us, it's a mentoring group in memory of Stanford professor Raji Motwani that we started, is that there is a lot of enthusiasm and energy in the valley in, among the brilliant technologists, students, professors, entrepreneurs to help social causes. And uh, if there is a way to create a community to facilitate engagement and pull these people together in one group, amazing things come out, out of the box ideas come out. And so we're hoping to do that with AFI here, both in terms of volunteering with the projects there, brainstorming on interesting ideas, we, there is groups like Samasource here that are leveraging digital technology in amazing ways to help uh, provide livelihood to places sub-Saharan Africa, India and such. Gunita here is creating an archive of stories of uh, 1947 partition of India to help build empathy globally. So it's amazing what you can do with technology. And then there is also resources in terms of financial resources that um, Sanjay talked about. But what we would like to do is build a community around AFI 
and uh, social entrepreneurship and see kind of meet periodically and then tap into whatever people here would be interested in doing, whether it's engaging with the groups there, brainstorming on ideas, coming up with new models, and also solving some of the really, really complex challenges around scaling uh, social entrepreneurship in places like India. They're very unique challenges. And if we get time, we'll talk a bit about that. The other unique challenge is uh, distribution. One of the biggest challenges in addressing bottom of the pyramid markets is how do you scale distribution? When the end user, it might be in some remote village, the per cost ca that you'll make, this is for uh, social entrepreneurs, you're looking at for-profit models as well as non-profit. How do you actually get to that user in a cost-effective manner? And then also coming up with very novel models to leverage technology. So we're looking at a wide range of things. And uh, with that, Sanjay, would you like to add a bit about what we're looking at? So uh, again, as I was mentioning, uh, we uh, launched the Silicon Valley chapter last fall. Uh, and uh, the whole uh, premise of starting this was that there is a huge concentration of uh, uh, yeah, uh, Indian or origin uh, successful uh, entrepreneurs uh, and uh, investors and uh, uh, executives. And in addition to that, uh, as I said, the uh, valley uh, from people around the world, there's a huge diversity and uh, in terms of yeah, technology innovation that starts from this region and goes to different parts of the world. We felt that there'd be merit in starting uh, having our chapter here. So to leverage uh, these uh, resources that we have uh, here and connect them with the social innovators in India, be it as mentors, be it as investors, or what have you. So, Radhika, can I ask kind of a, a the severe question? Go ahead. So, even worse than money, the thing that really doesn't scale is time. And yes. when you put your uh, resources and your contacts behind a particular initiative or an organization, there's a huge opportunity cost for what you're not doing <laughs> with course, that time. Of course. What was it that made you think AFI was the way that you should get, become more involved with this? Sure. So one of the things that really appeals to me, and I think will appeal to a lot of people here, is how far the time you put in, what is the impact of that? And the fact that this is a meta-level system that helps so many social entrepreneurs scale is what drew me when I met Sanjay about a year ago. Okay. So while it is very satisfying to one, work one-on-one -on -one with entrepreneur focus on a deep yeah, cause, yeah. it is also satisfying to have impact at a large scale, especially with technology. Technology is my passion yeah. and many of us here. And leveraging technology in a way where you can impact many people across the world, many social entrepreneurs who can then have large-scale impact is what drew me to AFI. Okay. And so kind of following up on that, Sanjay, when we talked by phone earlier this week, you were saying that really AFI is kind of like tie for social ventures and social innovation, right? The Indus Entrepreneurs, which is a huge organization. It's got 55,000 members all over the world. And Not quite, 15,000 members. Well, I, th <laughs> I thought it was even more than that all okay. over the world, individuals right. who are involved, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but in any case, how did, how did you feel that there was a need to have AFI? I mean, India has gone, a lot of these are great ventures, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of support for bottom of the pyramid kind of work in, in India. What was it that led you to feel that this was a really big need? Sure. So uh, again, to those of you who are not familiar with Thai, it stands for the Indus Entrepreneurs. It's a global network. There are about 17 uh, countries, 60 chapters around the world, and about 15,000 or 20,000 members. So they are a platform for fostering entrepreneurship, mentoring entrepreneurs. So this is for primarily for for-profit entrepreneurs. And when I was yeah, looking at uh, the uh, domain, uh, or the space of uh, social innovation, social entrepreneurship in India, there were yeah, so many uh, challenges affecting uh, the uh, entrepreneurs. There were a lot of people willing to walk away from lucrative careers in the private sector. But even, I mean, yeah, they identified problems, they came up with solutions, they expressed commitment in terms of pursuing them. But then there was time, yeah, be it in terms of lack of funding, be it in terms of not having access to the right technology solutions, be it government regulations that were kind of uh, becoming constraints. So I felt that, yeah, if there could be one similar platform where people could come together, you give them an opportunity to collaborate with each other, and you get the best of uh, breed innovators into the network and people with access to government. For example, Sam uh, Petroda is the advisor to the Prime Minister of India, and Mr. Desh Deshpande is an advisor to President Barack Obama. So people of their stature saw merit in this effort, and uh, I felt that, yeah, with uh, those kind of resources uh, in place, we could make a dent. You came at it really from the angle of being an impact investor as well as an entrepreneur, right? Uh, yeah, so from my, your own my own personal prime background. background. Right. 
What do you think? Is it time? Can we try calling Sam? Uh, five, five. Sure, sure. Five, uh, okay. It's still a few minutes early. Should I give him another three minutes? Or uh, if he's on Skype, if you can just check. He, uh, right now he shows up with a question mark. Okay, I can give uh, him a So I'm not sure. Oh, if you'd give him, I'm yeah. online, he says. He, he just said a minute ago he's online. Oh, he is? Yeah. Okay. Sam yeah. Yeah, he hasn't. He hasn't <coughs> answered my contact oh, request. Yeah, yeah. how much time are you devoting each week to this kind of activity, either with uh, AFI Sam, or with there was other, a uh, other social entrepreneurship Probably 15% of my time. Uh -huh. And you accept that invitation on Skype? And also quite a bit on mentoring as well. Yeah. Sam, this is Richard Dasher calling in from Stanford. Yes, sir. How are you? Thank you very much. I can hear you well. Let me just, but I can't see you that well because your roof, yeah, I can see you better now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and what I'm going to do after we make sure that this is working well is I'm going to turn around so you can see the people in the auditorium. I'll just move my laptop in the other direction. Okay. Uh, can you send us a video? I'm just sending. It's just circling around but not going through. <laughs> yeah, maybe it could be that our connection isn't quite live yet. Thank you very much for joining us today, by the way. Welcome, but uh, let's hope that this thing works. Normally it works. <laughs> yeah, we've usually been pretty uh, fortunate with this. In fact, just last week I called in from Tokyo, Japan. So I do 10 of these a week. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. But you know, sometimes in my office they play with my computer. Please <laughs> upgrade that. So, and Sam, we've had a wonderful introduction to your background and okay. who you are. Tell us why you think AFI is important and what are your main hopes for this organization? I think the idea of AFI is to really bring together young talent interested in social ventures and social okay. innovations. Idea is to provide a platform for young people to come, interact, learn, and see how they can make a contribution. Let me do this. Let me reset my computer. Okay. Five. Shall I hang up for a second? Yeah. We can talk here for a minute. Well, I'll hang up and we'll try this again in a second. Bye for now. So. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll let me take a quick minute to talk about Sam. Uh, again, yeah, for those of you who don't know much about him, I, I did mention something uh, at the beginning. So his current roles are advisor to the Prime Minister of India, chairman of India's National Innovation Council. And uh, so back, I think in the 1960s, uh, just like most of the other uh, Indians in this country, he finished his, uh, yeah, uh, I think, uh, undergraduate studies in India, then came here for his graduate studies. He was uh, studying at the Illinois Institute of Technology mm -hmm. in Chicago. Then uh, he became, a, I think he was that's working. The, that's the other IIT. IIT. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sure. And then he worked in a couple of telecom companies. I think Rockwell was one of them. And then uh, after getting some experience, in fact, he had a startup in the Valley also, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, became a successful serial entrepreneur, a self-made millionaire. And then uh, in one of his trips to India, uh, I think this was in the early 80s, he, uh, this is much earlier before cell phones and before all this uh, Skype and all, all, all that stuff, he was trying to make a call uh, to his wife here in the U.S. And for whatever reason, that call, uh, yeah, it took him a long time to kind of make that connection happen. And that's <laughs> what was the trigger. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so some things have not really changed is what you're telling me. I'm gonna, let, let yeah, me ask sure. you a quick question about something else before we bring Sam back on, okay? Yeah. Um, you gave a number of examples about projects from India that have been applied outside India. Right. What do you see as the biggest challenges for uh, localization in regard to doing this kind of social innovation. So how do you make this not, on, not only from in different places inside India, but how do you take these on a worldwide scale? 
So, uh, Mr. Deshpande tries to kind of mention that, yeah, the, one of the most important things in the social innovation uh, sphere is you need to kind of become completely attuned with that local environment unless you really understand the problems of the region and not, you can't do that kind of remotely, kind of uh, sitting 20,000 miles away, you can't be the theoretizing, intellectualizing yeah. about things. You need to kind of yeah, immerse yourself in that local environment and then, uh, yeah, the be it technology or be it anything else comes later. But uh, a granular understanding of the problem is most important and I think that's the one step in a rush to kind of yeah, optimize and accelerate things, that's missed and that's what leads to obstacles and uh, successful replication. Okay, let me try Sam again. Okay. Cool. And Sam is 70 years old. He's had two quadruple bypass surgeries. He survived cancer, but he still has the energy of a 25-year-old person. He's got a young team of people who always find it difficult to kind of keep up with him. Just uh, amazing in terms of his energy levels there. Talk about his communications godfather of India as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he's uh, considered the father of modern Indian telecom, as I mentioned. I mean, uh, he organized. Uh, he uh, founded these two organizations. One was CDOT, Center for Development of Telematics, and one was CDAC, Center for Development of Advanced Computing. These are the organizations which sowed the seeds uh, for yeah, what led to uh, the uh, yeah, research development of indigenous technology, telecom technology, and now all the work, uh, man and marine cell phones for 1.0 billion people. <coughs> Didn't quite get an answer this time. We'll okay. see. One more time. Still rebooting, maybe. <laughs> He's probably still rebooting his computer. Aha. Okay, it's ringing. That's a good sign. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Yes, sir. <laughs> I said it, but my camera still goes on. I yeah. Um, it's great to hear you, and glad you can join <laughs> us by audio. Um, maybe I can ask you to give a few remarks to everybody Please. here. Please. Yeah even though we don't have the video link. Okay, I can start first by thanking everybody. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. 99% of the time this thing works. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, it doesn't, my apology. I had too many meetings today, so I just didn't get a chance to test it. I'm delighted to be with you, and I want to thank Sanjay for organizing this. The group that Sanjay and I work together really focuses on social innovation. As you know, India has 550 million young below age of 25. We have huge amount of challenges related to disparity, disparity between rich and poor, urban, rural, educated, uneducated. And we also have to expedite the process of modernization, development. And in the process, we have to make sure that this growth is inclusive and focus is more on bottom of the economic pyramid. To do a lot of these things, we believe we need to take advantage of the technology, mainly information and communications, also biotech, nanotech, material, alternate energy, and we also need to innovate. We need to innovate to create new business models for education, health, public services, agriculture, energy, because we realize that the existing models are expensive and difficult to scale for us because we need to focus on affordability, scalability, and sustainability. So technology is definitely going to play an important role in many of these areas. So one big task we have today is to democratize information. 
to take information to people to empower them. And we are building massive networks to democratize information. As you know, not too long ago, we had 2 million telephones in India. It used to take 10, 15 years to get a telephone connection. Today, we have 900 million mobile phones. We are a nation of a connected billion. And we need to take this connectivity forward to really bring about generational change in the way we do things. So we are spending a lot of money in creating broadband infrastructure using fiber to connect all our universities, libraries, R&D institutions, all our local governments, 250,000. And this is going to require about 450,000 kilometers of optical fiber, in addition to the million kilometers we already have. Then we are creating platforms for UID, GIS, payment, procurement, applications. And we believe once the information gets democratized, we'll begin to focus on innovative ideas for the bottom of the economic pyramid. Again, this would relate to education, health, agriculture, commerce, financial services, governance, and a lot of young people are already thinking about these things. Our needs are very different, mainly because we have a large population. We need to lower down the cost of delivery of public services. And we believe because of cloud computing, open source software, generic drugs, and many other unique opportunities, even open drug discovery platform, gives us a lot of hope. Government is trying to create friendly policies, but it takes time. It takes time to go from the old mindset to the new mindset. I feel very optimistic because we have huge amount of potential young talent. I have said many, many times that the best brains in the world are busy solving problems of the rich who really don't have problems to solve. And as a result, problems of the poor really don't get the right kind of talent. We have the largest number of poor in the world. And we have moral responsibility to address the problems of the poor. And that's what we are trying to do. It's not going to happen overnight. These things take decades. But our journey has just started. And what Sanjay is doing at Action for India relates to bringing young talent together and address the challenges of the bottom of the economic pyramid. Several ventures have already shown us that it is possible to do it. Government is quite encouraged with the results we have seen. And we want young entrepreneurs to come help us. To me, that's the basic message. With this, we can probably open up for some discussions. And I would once again yeah. thank Sanjay and the professor for giving me this opportunity. I want to apologize for not having the video, but at least I can see you all. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Sam, thank you very much. And your message comes through loud and clear, even if uh, we didn't have a video image to accompany it. Uh, would you be willing to stay for a few questions? Yes, sir. I'll be delighted. OK. I have a question for the whole panel, and then we'll open it up to uh, the audience. Sure. The whole idea of sustainability when it comes to social innovation, 
is a little different than it is in other areas of entrepreneurship because in other areas of entrepreneurship you have a clear exit where the original people basically sell their stock, including the founders, because after a company goes public, the founder is working for a public company, not their own company. And I would like to ask what you see as the best model for long-term sustainability for a social venture. Sam, I let me ask you to go first. Sure. I think social venture does not necessarily imply donations. Social ventures have to have a business model to sustain. Profits may not be 30%, 40%. Profit may not be on a quarter to quarter basis. Equity may not come from venture capitalists only. It could come from, you know, trust, government. It could get some subsidy. But at the end of the day, it has to have a business model with some bottom line profit to feed it back into it. Otherwise, it is not sustainable. Okay. Unless the social venture is profitable and sustainable, you might be able to sell it to somebody, to a bigger social venture. You might be able to take it public. May not have the same value and ratios, but it's wrong to assume that social ventures imply always donations. Okay, thank you. That's a, uh, I appreciate that. Sanjay, what would you say? Sure. So in the presentation uh, that uh, I gave earlier today, we discussed at least four of these entrepreneurs. I was mentioning that two of them were the for-profit variety and two of them were the not-for-profit kind. So a digital green uh, in the agriculture domain was uh, being supported by a, uh, currently a $10 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, whereas Baba Job in Bangalore uh, trying to yeah, uh, help uh, these uh, uh, yeah, rural BPO interval workers or domestic staff for the informal sector, that was a for-profit venture. And uh, right here in the Valley, Kosla Ventures, their social impact division was funding them. So it's not so much in terms of yeah, whether it's a market-based solution or not, as long as the entrepreneur and the organization is able to kind of demonstrate value to the target audience, I think uh, uh, as long as that, uh, the quality of the, uh, yeah, the value addition uh, is positive, I think things can be sustainable. Even right here in the Valley, everybody has heard about uh, Salma Khan and the Khan Academy. And there, it could have gone either way, but I think uh, Bill Gates gave me a donation or yeah, John Doe gave me a donation, and he chose not to go the market-based solution, and he felt that that was a better route to sustainability than uh, uh, going through the market-based solution. So my uh, point of view is that it's not a question of yeah, equity, non-equity, exit, non-exit. It's a question of in terms of what value uh, does the entrepreneur and his firm give to the entire target audience. Radhika, what do you look at for this? Sure. So I'll turn around the question a bit, and because uh, I've thought about this, discussed this a lot with people, and I think it is in the interest of most um, social causes to think sustainability because it's just really hard to raise donations and just be dependent on others, right? Yeah. And uh, so um, uh, Summer Source is one example, right on the way to sustainability. They have a model and they're doing something where it's possible to generate revenues. That said, there are some causes such as infant mortality, human rights, what Gunita is doing, right? That is really, really hard to make them sustainable. And I'm on the board of a nonprofit that helps rural girls in Mozambique pull them out of the cycle of exploitation and get them into this elementary schools. We've looked at models of sustainability. We even looked at the girls can make some crafts, but it was very, very hard. So I'm not convinced every social venture can be sustainable. But what I've seen is if they're not, it's a constant, constant challenge. Okay, thank you. And there are some causes that just require con constant effort. Yeah. Okay, let's open the floor. Uh, <coughs> um, I You're on. Uh, <laughs> my name is George Gregory, and, uh, and I have a question for, um, for the panel. You know, uh, what, what is your view on the, actually following up on sustainability, right? Uh, so what is your view on the emerging uh, structures in business Specifically, benefits corporation that's in many states now became uh, became available, and a B corp, which is kind of which is kind of a, a weaker form of it, which allows you know for-profit ventures essentially to 
you know, to a lot, to, to introduce, uh, you know, social benefit as the reason for existence of the corporation. In addition, you know, in, in, in the benefit. No, it's great that you bring this up because this is a relatively new type of company in the United States. It's recognized state by state. And right now, I think there's 15 or 20 states that recognize what are called B Corps. They are technically for-profit corporations that in their board, in their bylaws, state that all or part of their profits are going to be put back into nonprofit causes. This allows the board of directors not to be sued by stockholders who are unhappy with less than um, highest return on the funding. Uh, and, you know, this has had an impact, although it takes quite a lot to be formally recognized as a B Corp. You actually have to pass several different tests. Uh, but for the panel, I think the question is, when you're looking at a new social venture, how do you decide to determine whether it should be a nonprofit or a B Corp or whether it should just be volunteer activities that doesn't require a legal entity? I think it would depend, this is Sam, it would depend on the kind of activities you are involved in. If it is related to infant mortality, you may have equipment to sell which may have be, may have some profitability. God. Sorry about that. <laughs> Screensaver. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, my screensaver just came in. I've got I forgot to turn it off. Okay. Uh, so the point is it all depends. I think we can't get locked up in one model or the other model when it comes to social venture. It will be this and that and some more and we'll have to experiment. But the fact is that you will not expect the kind of return that you probably expect out of a normal venture. That's given. So if you're expecting 20% IRR, don't get involved in social venture. <laughs> are they, right? Are there other things you shouldn't expect if you get involved in a social venture? <laughs> Sanjay, would you like to take this one? Yeah. So one of the things that we try to do at Action for India, uh, as I said, yeah, there are various inputs that we're trying to provide to the uh, entrepreneurs, uh, be it in terms of uh, uh, access to funding, access to mentors. Uh, one uh, mandate that we've taken upon ourselves is to serve as an interface between public policy and social innovation in India. So uh, uh, again, most of these innovators, these entrepreneurs, uh, yeah, as I said, they have yeah, said no to lucrative careers in the private sector. They are uh, they have identified problems. Uh, they've come up with solutions for them. They've expressed commitment in pursuing them. So the government should also come halfway in terms of helping them. Uh, uh, yeah, in terms of removing uh, regulatory hurdles or obstacles, or giving them more pathways and making it easier, cutting the red tape, so that uh, yeah, the effort that they put in yeah, is the some uh, yeah, level of uh, return, not necessarily financial, but in terms of even from an impact basis. So B Corp is something that's kind of yeah, getting traction here in the U.S. and uh, in an earlier forum in India, this is this very issue came up in our discussions with the entrepreneurs. They wanted the government of India to yeah, take steps in terms of making this B Corp. Uh, uh, possible, uh, that's actually possible in India as well, and uh, we will work with the government in trying to see what can happen in terms of accelerating or expanding that. Radhika, in your experience, have you seen a lot of uptick in the number of social ventures that are being proposed in recent years? In the, uh, the uh, 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 a rapid in increase in the number of social ventures that are that you hear about these days. By social ventures, are you talking of for profits or, or just social Anything. causes? Yeah. Social causes. I do see many more. At least my I, my perspective is from Silicon Valley, right? I'm uh -huh, based right. here, and I do come across more and more. And I also see many which kind of overlap that people are building very interesting technology startups with a clear for profit business model, and they're very interested in social impact. So. I see a lot of hybrids, and okay. I also see a lot of non-profits. And I just wanted to add one point to the previous question, if I may, that I think to some degree it matters a lot on where the entrepreneur is coming from, that yeah. what is their intrinsic motivator, and clear trade-off of, as Sam was saying, there is no one fixed model, but what works for each group, each cause, and each human being may vary. Yeah. And having brutal intellectual honesty on what will it take to execute, if you just want to do a non-profit, but you don't think about what it will take to raise donations, right? Thinking through yeah. some of those might be very helpful. Yeah. And on that, Salman Khan 
he, when he shares his life story, it's very relevant to this point. He had the ability to do a for-profit. Uh, the reason he chose a non-profit in his case is he felt he could execute way more effectively. Uh -huh. And he was okay doing both models, but the okay. resources he could um, harness that way seemed like that would help him execute as one of the story he shares. So okay. about that. Thank you. We have several hands. Um, Sri, let me ask you to go first. Sam, uh, one of the things that caught my attention was uh, you had noted that there are public models uh, in India where there is demonstrated efficiency of social uh, execution and therefore learnings to be had. And of course, Sanjay in his talk earlier on talked about the sandbox approach to uh, what the Deshpande Foundation is doing in order to produce aggregated social innovation across organizations to provide ecosystem benefits. Can you share with us uh, a couple of examples, either in India or otherwise, where there are clear examples of sharing uh, models of innovation, because these are not well talked about, unlike private markets, which are talked about in business schools and other forums, social innovation business models are often not much in vogue. So I'm curious whether you could share a couple of examples. Sam, could you understand that question? Could you hear from where you are? Sure. Okay. First of all, it's a little too early, but at the same time, there are examples, and many, many examples that one could look at. Take, for example, Dr. Devi Shetty in Bangalore, who provides quadruple bypass for $2,000. Now, this has been proven. He does it day in, day out. And he's now going to set up a hospital in Caribbean with 1,200 beds for the U.S. market to go from 50 to 80 thousand dollars for bypass to 2,000 is a huge difference. Similarly, Irvin Eye Care provides cataract bypass, a cataract surgery for two dollars. There are 10 examples like this in India that we know of whether it is Jaipur Foot, these are all well-known examples. And there are some not very well-known. Whether it is uh, sort of fuel for cooking at a very low cost, or a cooling refrigerator at $20. So these examples are already there, but it's too early because the history of social ventures is very new. It doesn't have the enough, you know, 50 year, 100 year uh, data to back it up. So okay. we don't need to have all the answers. I think it's, you know, those who are looking for all the answers will not find all the answers. So some people will be comfortable with less answers, others would be not very comfortable. So those who are not comfortable won't get into it, you know. And those who are comfortable yeah. with fewer answers will get into it. So I don't think social venture is for everybody, you know. Okay, I think that's a, an, an excellent point. What you really need is the business model that works for your venture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to a certain extent, if you find things that are out there that are useful, great. But you may have to be clever and discover a new one. Absolutely. Uh, let's do one more question. Go ahead. You mentioned that a lot of the people behind the organizations that you're backing have kind of turned down lucrative job opportunities in Silicon Valley and other high-tech places. Um, but it seems like relying on that is not the most sustainable uh, option because really the people who are most motivated to start these kinds of ventures are the people who are living in those circumstances in the first place, um, I would think. So have you done anything to back people who are actually coming out of the underprivileged communities that they're serving and, and kind of educate, like bridge the, the education gap and help them get something started um, kind of from the place that they would eventually be serving rather than turning away from a, a more, you know, first world career option in the first place? 
I completely agree with you that talent is not just in Silicon Valley. That is all over the world, maybe in different degree. We have in Kerala a startup village where government has given about 100,000 square feet facility with power, you know, living space and all that to young people to start ventures. We have already started about 300 ventures, 300. And many are successful. One company is already worth about 30, 40 million dollars there from scratch. These are all young people. I went there myself. Most of them basically live there. Age group of early 20s. And they are doing some very interesting work in energy and mobile. The smartest hacker in India is a guy from Bihar, 15 year old, whose father is a peon. So there are all kinds of examples in India. It's not that we are expecting Silicon Valley fellows to leave their, you know, $200,000 job and go and serve in India. But it is good to be connected. It is good to interact. It is good to learn. And that's what this exercise is all about. OK. Sam, thank you. I want to ask Sanjay to comment briefly. How is AFI going to try to bring up on entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, from the bottom of the pyramid? Sure. So uh, Richard, when I was talking to you about uh, the Desh Pandey Foundation's uh, uh, model, the sandbox model, and how AFI was trying to replicate those regional hubs of social innovation around the country. I told you there were essentially three steps, and the third step in there was actually trying to uh, make efforts, focus your efforts in terms of how you can create a nurturing environment for some of the local population to be inspired by some of these best of breed social innovators who come to that region. But they, it's their involvement. They're uh, getting yeah, involved and inspired to uh, address the problems of their region. If you were to depend on outsiders coming in, yeah, that problem uh, will not go away. The solutions that you develop are going to be open solutions. So what you can do, uh, what Action for India intends to do through this region of innovation is to work with the partner organizations, be it banks for giving them uh, low interest collateral free loans, be it in terms of identifying the corporate social responsibility divisions of corporates to give uh, yeah, uh, the financial resources to some of them to set up shop there. So the focus is very clearly in building the talent from the ground up in that region. So that will take time. I mean, yeah, the people I mentioned to you, next drop, Anu Sridhar is a Berkeley grad, Rikin Gandhi of Digital Green is an MIT, Karim Banan grad, but not all the innovators are like that. But it's inspiring to see them yeah, say no to uh, these uh, kind of comforts in Silicon Valley or elsewhere. So there is a kind of a search for meaning. The reason why they do it is, again, yeah, the financial element is one dimension. But when you see the impact at such level, I mean, Rikin Gandhi is kind of making a difference in the lives of tens of thousands of farmers in India. How does it compare by you know, sitting in behind a desk and doing a coding job at Oracle or wherever else he was working before? So it's that that's driving them. It's not as if yeah, they're sacrificing, but it's a different uh, kind of yeah, search for meaning and uh, yeah, value uh, that they're kind of uh, hoping to gain. Okay. I'm afraid that we're out of time for the formal part of the session, and I know we have to shut down the auditorium. We've got some refreshments outside, and hope you'll join our panelists here, Radhika and Sanjay. Uh, Sam, thank you so much for participating remotely. Everyone, please give me a <laughs> applause. Sam, in your closing comments, can you just speak to the audience and suggest in terms of for them to meaningfully engage with the social innovators in India and the ecosystem enablers in India, what would be, how can they meaningfully engage? Just some closing comments. First, I think you need to learn a little more about what's going on in India. I find that a lot of people are very ignorant about what's really happening. They rely on the media and press, which only talks about cricket, Bollywood, and gossip. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to go beyond that and see what exactly is happening on the ground level. Then connect with one or two or five people in your areas of interest, either <clears throat> in terms of geography, in terms of subject, in terms of age group or whatever, and build that network 
and you could be here and be of great help. You don't have to be there. I think the idea is to really network with people of equal interest, similar interest. But before that, you've got to really learn about what's going on there. Educate yourself. I would suggest that would be a good starting point. And India is going to be around. India is going to continue to grow at 8 to 10 percent for next 25 years, guaranteed, leaving aside few glitches here and there. Because there are 550 million young below age of 25. Because we got to create 10 to 15 million new jobs every year, year after year. We have no options but to do it. And it's a virgin territory. So there is too much to do. Technology is the answer. And talent is required from all over the world. That's the message. Thank you. OK. Thank, Thank you, Simon. Thanks, everybody. markets in the world, a lot of the credit can be traced back to the work that Sam Petroda did back in the 80s. Uh, and uh, so I had met with him at an alumni, uh, IIT alumni conference in Washington, D.C. several years ago. I'd been loosely in touch with him. And in the last couple of years, those interactions became more frequent and focused, leading to the current mission of this organization and the launch of our first event in January of 2002. So we are a fairly nascent organization, about a year and a half old. But uh, this is uh, how it all began. Uh, and uh, I should uh, uh, accept, I mean, I should uh, recognize, acknowledge the connection that uh, Action for India has to Stanford. Among the advisory board, there are at least four individuals uh, who are the current Stanford faculty or uh, who have been Stanford alums. On the left is uh, Mark Granovetter, he's the chair of the Department of Sociology. On the right is Professor Hayagriva Rao, he's a professor in uh, the uh, GSP. And uh, here you have Srini Akaraju, who's a Stanford MD and PhD, is currently a general partner at Sofinovo Ventures, which is a biotech uh, VC firm. And at the bottom, you have GDS Ram Kumar, uh, who was again a PhD in computer science and currently is an entrepreneur with Concept IO. So uh, <clears throat> there's been a, uh, yeah, quite a bit of uh, yeah, expertise and insights drawn from these individuals. So I'm thankful to the community that you all represent. Uh, I just want to yeah, take a minute to give you a better context in terms of what Action for India is and uh, what exactly we do. I did mention in the first slide. But uh, I want to use, uh, yeah, by way of explanation, uh, this organization called uh, Rashtriya Shwast Bhima Yojana, RSBY for short. So uh, RSBY is a public-private partnership between the government of India and about 12 different private health insurance companies. Uh, it was founded by this uh, gentleman here, Anil Swaroop. He's one of the senior bureaucrats in India. He's part of the Ministry of Labor in New Delhi. He started this initiative about four years ago. And there are a few uh, interesting things about this initiative. Given that this program was targeting poor people, uh, who are mostly illiterate, uh, they, the founders of the program, they didn't want the participants to fill up elaborate health insurance forms or uh, do signatures. So they designed the program to be completely paperless. And they also wanted to minimize fraud in the system. Uh, so what happens is, yeah, uh, anybody who signs up for the program, uh, he, makes a one, he or she makes a one-time payment of 30 rupees, which is 60 cents. And uh, with that payment, they and a family of up to four members gets access to health care benefits up to 30,000 rupees or $600, which is a pretty good deal for the individual and the family. But the reason why that, uh, yeah, it's uh, so attractive is because the government of India heavily subsidizes this program. But the reason why the private health insurance companies participate in a program like this is because it makes business sense for them to do so, not because it's a charity activity for them. That's the way the whole program has been architected, and that's interesting in its own right. Uh, uh, so uh, what happens is, yeah, so I told you that the program was designed to be paperless. It's also designed to be cashless. So, but because of the technology that is developed, uh, say that uh, the act of cutting a pipe, you don't have to take that person to the field. You don't have to have a hacksaw. You don't have to have a pipe. But uh, in the computer lab itself, uh, the person who is being trained can experience the resistance that one feels when you put the hacksaw to the pipe. So what essentially uh, all this uh, yeah, uh, stuff does is it reduces the amount of resources required 
to train a set number of people and uh, if the resources are the same more number of people can be uh, taught things faster uh, and uh, in a country uh, like India where 500 million people are below 25 years of age and uh, several tens of millions of jobs are required each year uh, something like this uh, can have great potential in terms of training people faster and giving them the jobs that they need. On the right uh, is Anu Sridharan. Uh, she's a, a Berkeley grad who is now uh, relocated to India and her firm is something called Next Drop. And uh, the very uh, simple uh, yeah, uh, idea, basically uh, the water supply that here which you take for granted, you have water supply 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. In India, it's a much more yeah, challenging thing, uh, especially in the summers and when uh, yeah, things are, the monsoons haven't arrived on time and things like that. Uh, the water supply becomes very uh, haphazard, random and people yeah, waste lots of, uh, the, so the water supply is only on a particular windows of time and uh, people don't know when they're going to get that water. So people tend to waste lots of time in terms of how uh, these things, uh, yeah, in terms of collecting the water that they need for their food and so forth. So she's developed uh, some yeah, interesting solutions, uh, yeah, leveraging the mobile platform to reduce that waiting time to make things more predictable. And she started off with a tier three city in, uh, called Hubli in uh, Northwest Karnataka. And now she's in the process of raising funds to kind of take it up to uh, the uh, national level in uh, other tier one, tier two cities. And uh, <coughs> this gentleman, Sean Blacksford is the founder of a company called Baba Job. Baba Job uh, is an organization uh, that, uh, you're familiar with monster.com in this country? It's basically it's a job matching site. Uh, engineer, project manager, salesman uh, goes to go, go to that side to kind of yeah, find uh, uh, relevant job opportunities. So what Monster does for the professional sector, Baba Job does for the informal sector. What do I mean by the informal sector? They could be cooks, uh, drivers, uh, rural BPO, entry level workers and so forth. Most of them are illiterate. They can't, uh, yeah, do not have the uh, computer literacy to be able to kind of uh, yeah, put their own profiles online and so forth. So uh, what they do is they've got this internet kiosks where these people can go there and submit basic information about themselves. For example, uh, imagine yeah, that uh, this was going on in uh, uh, the Silicon Valley. So they give them, uh, yeah, are they in Palo Alto or they in the East Bay or they uh, in San Francisco and so forth, the location where they want to kind of find the next gig. Secondly, the billing preferences. Yeah, do they want uh, yeah, $10 an hour job, $20 an hour job or $50 an hour job? So basic information and then It's a pleasure to be here uh, on, uh, in the Stanford campus and talking to you all about uh, a topic close to my heart, uh, social entrepreneurship. Uh, <clears throat> Richard was mentioning in terms of how India has got the kind of a head start uh, in this uh, domain, but I think yeah, necessity is the mother of invention. India is a country of 1.2 billion people and uh, a lot of uh, problems uh, with the, uh, the uh, demographics there, be it in terms of poverty, be it in terms of illiteracy and so forth. So when you have so many problems and at such a wide scale, there is uh, uh, automatic uh, processes set in motion to try to kind of form solutions to those problems and uh, that's what yeah, gives uh, India a kind of a unique role in this domain. I <clears throat> want to uh, yeah, begin with uh, uh, just a quick outline in terms of what I uh, covered in this talk. Uh, and so I'm going to start by mentioning some things about yeah, Action for India. And uh, one of our key uh, programs at Action for India, uh, creating a network of uh, hubs of social innovation. Uh, then going to give you a brief background in terms of the status or the current state of uh, social uh, enterprise, social, social enterprise in India, and uh, close by yeah, two uh, uh, quick topics. One in terms of how the work in India is actually relevant uh, for social uh, uh, development practitioners around the world, not just in India, and how the people in this audience can engage uh, with uh, our organization. <coughs> so. Our core mission at Action for India is to work with social innovators and by that I mean uh, they could be founders of for-profit social enterprises or they could be founders of not-for-profit NGOs but where they are addressing critical social issues in five sectors, education, healthcare, energy, livelihoods and agriculture. These are kind of the usual suspects when we talk of social innovation, social entrepreneurship. But what we do is we identify what we refer to as poised to scale social entrepreneurs in these five sectors and then uh, provide them, give them access to the resources that they need in uh, scaling up. And this could be access to funding, access to mentorship, access to technology resources, 
access to government decision makers and access to local partners or hub champions. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Our inspiration is uh, this gentleman uh, whose picture you see, Sam Petroda. He will be joining us in the talk later on. Sam Petroda uh, is currently the advisor to the Prime Minister of India and he's the chairman of India's National Innovation Council. And uh, back in the 1980s, uh, when uh, he was a member of the government of the Union Cabinet of India uh, with Rajiv Gandhi as uh, Prime Minister, he helped launch a series of activities uh, which in retrospect came to be known as the Telecom Revolution. And today in India, if you have 900 million cell phones for a population of 1.2 billion people and one of the fastest growing telecom yeah, uh, knows the power of technology. I have uh, chosen those organizations which have integrated technology to their operating and business models. So this organization, Jaldut, the founder is a, a gentleman uh, by the name Chandu Chavan. He comes from the western city of uh, Pune in India and uh, he's a very successful uh, commercial uh, entrepreneur. Uh, he runs a 1,000 crores or $200 million annual revenue business uh, in uh, uh, India, uh, something called Innoventive. And about three, four years ago, uh, he uh, got interested in the social sector and specifically in the uh, domain of purification of water and <coughs> delivery of purified water door to door. So what he does is he's got these uh, pickup trucks or three-wheel pickup trucks like the one that you see in the picture. And he's got a large container there which has a capacity for about 500 liters of water. And then he's got a state-of-the-art filtration system uh, which kind of filters bacteria, virus, arsenic, fluoride, and w what have you. Uh, so basically what happens is he, this vehicle can go to any source of water. Uh, it could be a bore well, it could be a pond, lake. So as long as the, uh, uh, the purification is uh, kind of below a particular threshold, the impurities are below a particular threshold, uh, they can pump the water from that source into that container and they can use the filtration system to do the purification in C2 uh, on the vehicle itself. And then the vehicle can go door to door uh, uh, in the area and uh, uh, kind of yeah, uh, sell uh, this purified water. So uh, th again, water, yeah, people say that, that the third world war will not be uh, fought for oil, but it will be fought for water. So this is increasingly becoming a more and more serious problem. Uh, and uh, this is uh, in some sense, yeah, uh, innovative solution. And actually the viability of the business model of this, uh, believe it or not, is actually depends on, a GP, uh, on an algorithm uh, uh, which is going to kind of uh, optimize the routes that this vehicle takes for delivery of the water. So right now he's in search for, uh, yeah, uh, kind of refining that uh, optimized algorithm, uh, which will help him uh, kind of reduce his uh, transportation costs to make this a viable business model. Uh, so any of you who are into optimization algorithms, I'd love to speak with you about this. Uh, then uh, one here is Bhavani. And uh, so, uh, yeah, th she's a, a lady who works in the vocational training space. And uh, she uh, uh, basically, uh, if some of you are in the computer science domain, you know uh, what the field of haptics is, H-A-P-T-I-C-S. It's the field of computer human interface. So she leverages the principles of haptics and creates virtual simulated environments uh, through which this whole vocational training can be uh, accelerated and can be scaled up. So one of the interesting things he's doing is, at the picture below you see a lot of these women. These women have been trained to become plumbers in the state of Kerala. Uh, so normally when you want to train anybody to become a plumber, what do you do? You take them to the field, you uh, yeah, teach them how to cut pipes, or you teach them how to fix a leaky faucet, and uh, uh, that's how they learn the uh, yeah, uh, trade. Uh, apart from the initial 30 uh, rupees that uh, the participants give to the government, there's no other cash in the system. So how do you make a health insurance program cashless and paperless? So what they do is they give the smart cards with a chip embedded in it to each participant. So whenever these participants yeah, go to a hospital or a clinic for a treatment, the card is swiped on the premises like a, a credit card and all the transactions happen at the back end. So these are kind of yeah, interesting things in their own right. One of the reasons I'm sharing this here at the beginning of my presentation is uh, the RSBY initiative has a few attributes that are aligned with the kind of work that we are doing or we want to do more of. Firstly, it's enabling this program is at the core, it's enabling social good at the bottom of the pyramid. Basically, poor people are getting access to healthcare benefits, and that's a good thing. Secondly, this program has achieved rapid scale in a short span of time. Uh, the program was begun, as I said, four years ago, and in these four years, about 33 million smart cards have been distributed among the uh, population, and assuming a family size of four, about 130 million Indians have come under the umbrella of this program. So even in a country of 1.2 billion people, this is a non-trivial significant number. 
And thirdly, bulk of this growth, uh, this rapid growth has happened because of RSB Web founders were very particular about leveraging technology to the health right from the word go. And in this case, smart card technology. So uh, Action for India being a year and a half old organization has had nothing to do with the success of this initiative. But uh, the reason I share this is because what we want to do or be at Action for India is to serve as a catalyst in the birth of and growth of initiatives like RSBY, which embody these three characteristics. And again, uh, enable social good at the bottom of the pyramid, achieve rapid scale in a short span of time, and the organization uses technology as part of its current business model or as part of its future uh, scaling uh, ambition. So that's uh, the kind of organization that you want to work with and help scale. <coughs> Uh, and uh, as I mentioned in my initial uh, this thing, so the five factors, I mean, when social innovators are looking to scale, at uh, the core of it, I mean, it's not rocket science, the needs that they have are pretty uh, kind of commonsensical. They need funding, uh, they need mentors, they need technology resources, uh, and government, yeah, that's a touchy uh, topic, at least in the US. Uh, so one does not have to take money from the government for your funding or what have you, but in the social sector, especially in India, one cannot afford to ignore the government because the government is such a powerful distribution channel for your products and services. You cannot achieve significant scale unless you partner with the government and interface with the government at different levels. And finally, local partners or hub champions. So through that, uh, and I'll be talking a little bit more uh, later on, uh, we intend to give market expansion opportunities to the innovators in our network. So these are the different ways in which uh, we work with the social innovators and help them scale. So uh, I want to uh, start off uh, yeah, by giving you a few examples of some of the innovators uh, in India, especially given this is an audience which uh, uh, 